question three, we this have is Taylor Walford from North Carolina State University Libraries and Virginia Ferris, also from North Carolina State University Libraries. So Taylor and Virginia, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Hi, everyone. Just a second while I get my presentation sorted. Okay, can we see my presentation? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Taylor Wolford, and I'm a special collections librarian at NC State University Libraries. I am very blessed today to also be co-presenting um, with my colleague, Virginia, who will be following up um, after my presentation today. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you all today about um, how I've worked with a faculty member to integrate um, historical role-playing games um, into course instruction using primary source materials. Some of you may not be familiar. I think I was dipping my toes into what historical role playing is with this class. Um, so I wanted to give a baseline definition um, for those of you who are not as familiar. Historical role playing is defined as participatory and performative forms of engagement with cultural heritage and historical topics. A couple examples of um, historical role playing is live action role playing, also known as LARPing, which is very fun. Um, tabletop role playing games. Um, so I grew up playing Dun Dungeons and Dragons. That's a really fun, a great example of a tabletop role playing game. Um, and also historical reenactments fall under the realm and category of historical role playing. So why historical role playing, I think, is particularly beneficial to course instruction with special collections materials is because uh, historical role playing often does require that the players have some working knowledge of historical events and historical context to advance their characters in a storyline. There are a lot of different elements of role playing games, but for the basics, I define three different basic elements of a role playing game. Um, there's character assignment. So first, each student is assigned a player or chooses a character with a set of characteristics or abilities. Um, and this character makes decisions and, and evolves as the game progresses. Um, another really important element of role playing games is world building. So this sets a kind of the stage for the ways that the characters are going to interact with each other and with historical events. It grounds the players in the characters in the reality of the world that they're playing in um, and sets parameters for what is and isn't possible. Um, and specifically for tabletop gameplay, which is a model that I used to develop this course instruction activity, there is a game master. So this is the instructor essentially, um, but the game master's function is to present challenges um, where the players can either adhere to the rules of the game or attempt to subvert them in really interesting ways. Um, last semester is the first semester, the spring um, 2024 semester was the first semester that I utilized um, historical role-playing games and course instruction. Um, so I worked with a faculty member very closely who's teaching a U.S. history of art since World War II class. Um, it was a group of about 12 to 15 undergraduate students who visited special collections six times over the course of the semester, and there were two sessions of each class, um, two sections of each class. Um, so for their first visit to special collections, um, the students were able to choose from a cast of characters that the faculty member and I um, devised and created character cards for. Um, so in the first session, the students were able to interact with special collections materials, ask questions, and also they chose their character that they would continue to adopt throughout the rest of the activities for the course of the semester. For each following session, um, the game master or instructors um, assigned each um, student or each character a historical event card and a challenge card to respond to as their character. Um, so where primary source materials came in is that for each historical event card and challenge card that the students were assigned, um, they had to, they were required to engage with primary source materials and special collections to inform their characters' actions and choices as the character moved throughout different social movements and historical events um, since World War II to today. For the final sessions, the students were able to create a zine from the perspective of their character, which was a, um, 
suggestion that Virginia actually gave um, us for the class. Um, and the students were able to create a zine from the perspective of their character that dealt with really difficult historical topics and historical movements um, in a way that they felt comfortable with. Um, and they also wrote a reflection paper at the end of the class in which they talked about the creation of their zine and also the historical gameplay process throughout the semester and what they learned from it. I wanted to give you all an example from one of the character cards the students were able to choose from in the beginning of the course. So um, to provide you with an example of a character card, it might read Kayla Thompson, born in 1938, grew up as a black woman in middle class family in Raleigh, North Carolina. Kayla grew up with a genuine love for America instilled by her parents who believed in the nation's potential for progress and equality. Um, so we kind of give the students enough of a background and a sense of who the character is, but also quite a bit of wiggle room to um, for the character to evolve and respond to historical change in really nuanced and interesting ways. Um, for the characters, as the students are um, responding to the prompts throughout the semester and having class discussions, um, participating in group activities, we also provided them with access to um, primary source material that spoke to the various historical events that their characters were interacting with um, and that the students were asked to respond to as their character. So um, Kayla was living through the period of desegregation in public schools in Raleigh, North Carolina at this um, at the time in which she was in high school. So um, these materials really speak to Kayla's experiences and provide the students with more context uh, to respond to the historical and event cards and challenge cards that we gave them. Um, another example is Kayla went to NC State University, which is where the students go <laughs> when they come to the class. Um, so uh, this Kayla eventually ended up going to NC State studying political science, and um, she became quite active in student orgs on campus and um, protesting civil rights violations in um, the Raleigh-Durham area. So these are the actions that the students devised for the character to make based on their um, knowledge of Kayla and the historical events that she was interacting with at the time. Here's an example of a historical event card. So, um, as they moved into the 1980s and their characters, uh, we asked their characters, um, the students, to uh, choose which uh, president their um, character would vote for in the 1980 election. Um, so an example of a historical event card would be based on their experiences um, and political views, who would they vote for in the presidential election of 1980. We also asked them with all of these prompts to provide pretty clear evidence for their argument using historical evidence to support um, their argument for which person their character would vote for. So um, they had actually an election in the class um, in which all of the characters, all of the students submitted um, an election ballot for who their character would vote for. And they also submitted um, documentation to provide evidence for why they thought their character at that time would vote a certain way in an election. So here again is some examples of primary source materials that the students would use to supplement their um, response prompts through the historical event cards. Um, a lot of these were sourced from other archives, including the um, Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and the Reagan Presidential Library, because we didn't have those materials on hand to provide to the students. Um, so they were also given access to a variety of other primary source um, repositories and archives that could provide them with context for their character's decision making process um, during a specific historical event. So student feedback is really important. I think we've all we all can agree, um, especially when you're doing something that's a little bit different or experimental. Um, the major feedback we got from the students who participated in the game throughout the course of the semester was that the game did encourage students to develop a sense of historical empathy, um, which is great. Um, that's exactly what one of our goals with um, developing a historical role playing game for course instruction. Um, so they were really able to understand why people living through different periods of time and different historical change uh, moments of historical change could make a decision or would be influenced by a variety of factors um, to make a decision 
Um, we also interestingly found that some students felt uncomfortable making decisions as their character. Um, that was especially true when the character's decision was not aligned with the student's personal views. Um, so I still think that is room for reflection and critical thinking on the student's part. But it's interesting to note that the students did feel a sense of unease um, in some cases if their character was so different from themselves. Um, overall, the majority of the students felt that the role playing game increased um, their understanding of course topics and encouraged critical analysis of the primary source materials we provided them. For future plans, we do want to develop, the faculty member and I do want to develop stronger groundwork um, for guiding the students through the game as the semester progresses. So we were thinking something along the lines of a student game book, an instructor manual, and also a, a curriculum packet that includes all of the primary source materials we would use for the class. Um, and we have already begun digitizing all of the primary source documents that the student used for the class. Um, props. Um, and lastly, our department is very big on incorporating making into course instruction. So given that it is an art class or a history of art class, we're very interested in the idea of the students potentially making flyers, posters, artwork, and political buttons as an example, um, as a representation of the character's beliefs throughout the game. So that is my time for today. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thanks so much, Taylor. And I like how we are matching in our, we're, we're in rooms right next to each other right now. So obviously working really closely. <laughs> um, so I uh, am going to start sharing my screen just a moment. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, so uh I am Virginia Ferris, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the lead librarian for outreach and engagement for special collections at NC State um, University Libraries. So I work with Taylor and lots of other folks in our department, um, kind of coordinating instruction and outreach. And so as Taylor mentioned, we are very interested in making in um, our classroom and outreach work. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that work and specific um, ways that we've done that with STEM collections and STEM students in the classroom. So for some context, NC State is um, a land-grant university in North Carolina. So there's a big focus on STEM fields. Um, and the libraries uh, has a very strong um, system of support for those fields, including um, a lot of emphasis on using technology. Um, also a great emphasis on making. Um, there are several maker spaces on campus and in the libraries that focus on all kinds of high tech, low tech and no tech making from 3D printing and laser cutting to sewing and um, building things from hand um, to create in all kinds of ways, um, kind of engineering to artistic. Um, so as part of that, we also have an amazing group of colleagues, um, including Taylor, who are on a well-being committee in the libraries, who have um, shifted some of that focus of making beyond the classroom to kind of general support for student success and mental health in a series called um, Crafting Resilience, where students can drop in different um, hours throughout the semester to learn a craft or practice a craft or just relax and like hang out um, and use some of that hands-on um, making to kind of explore their own creativity and just uh, kind of take a break. Um, so making is a very uh, uh, kind of integrated into lots of things that happen in the libraries and um, special collections is sort of making our way into that world as well, though it might not be obvious um, all the ways that that could happen. So another point of context is our special collections um, kind of maps some of the strengths of the university in uh, a lot of STEM fields. So our collecting areas listed here, um, I describe them as uh, kind of a core of, of documenting the university's history, and then also a lot of fields that are strengths for NC State, everything from agriculture and engineering textiles, veterinary medicine, and zoological health, um, as well as uh, architecture and design and other things like that. Um, we also have a, a newer collecting areas of animal rights and animal welfare, environmental justice, computer simulation. Um, you can see the whole list here. So um, the general kind of approach that we've had in the past is wanting to 
um, broadcast to our communities on campus in STEM disciplines, we have some really amazing collections representing the work you're doing and what's happened in this field historically. Um, and even if you're not a historian, we think we have material that would could, could be really interesting to you. So we have to kind of get out of our building and our kind of traditional um, uh, historian boxes sometimes and archives to uh, engage these disciplines and find creative ways to show them what we have that's a value and, and interest and relevance for them. Um, so one, some ways that we've done this successfully in the past is um, sharing the university history uh, with faculty in textiles or food science and nutrition or other disciplines and showing them um, we can bring your students in and kind of give them context for their discipline here on campus, what people have done here at NC State in um, civil engineering since the beginning um, and see how it's changed and see students like them from 100 years ago or whatever it may be. Um, it's especially uh, useful when highlighting the student experience and especially of marginalized communities and contributions that they've made to STEM uh, kind of work on campus over history. Um, and beyond campus, we have a lot of materials in our collections, including our rare books that give more of a um, big picture historical perspective on um, the evolution of the history of science, of technology, or of a specific field, um, like this rare book on the top right here. Um, it's from our uh, rare book collection. It's sort of an early printed book about um, entomology. So that's something we use in a lot of book history classes, but also could bring in to um, an entomology class to show kind of before a lot of the practices that we're familiar with now and the scientific method, this is how people were thinking about entomology um, in the 17th century. Um, another route that has been really successful is finding faculty champions in STEM departments because there are usually kind of secret historians in any department that doesn't seem to have an obvious connection. Um, material science and engineering, there are uh, people throughout disciplines like this who we found who say, um, I really want to make use of archives to get my students engaged in this bigger picture thinking about what we're doing, how we got to this point, how our technology and ideas have evolved. Um, so finding those faculty champions is not straightforward, but once you do, that's a great way to kind of build the momentum. Um, so then lastly, thinking about ways to introduce making and kind of creative hands-on work is um, an approach that we're really excited about lately. Um, some of the ways that has happened in different classroom and kind of extracurricular outreach um, zine making is uh, extremely fun and easy and what we're going to talk about a little bit more in a moment um, and something that I know lots of archives are <clears throat> practicing and collecting um, and I can give a shout out to Kelly Wooten at Duke who's been a great kind of leader for us um, and our former colleague Philip McDonald who also kind of gave our department the zine bug. We all kind of learned from him and um, it's been a really exciting um, introduction to a lot of the work we do. Um, also, Lino Cut Printing, Taylor organized an amazing class workshop last year um, and that's pictured on the bottom left here, students who were looking at book history and the, the sort of woodcuts and how to um, print images in a, a kind of more mass scale. So they were able to create their own lino cut prints and then replicate them um, to give them a hands-on understanding of how these books would have been created and the technology involved. Um, we also have incredible colleagues in our preservation unit who have brought in book binding and notebook making into classes and more general outreach. Um, you can see the middle picture here is from like an open public science event where um, our colleague Emily had a notebook maker where people could come make their own notebooks using um, images from our collections as the covers um, to kind of take something home with them and learn more about what we have here and what they could make use of. And then other things, collage, um, creative journaling, all kinds of um, just hands-on ways of understanding and engaging with the kind of materials we have. And the goals, why we wanna do this, um, bring folks in to kind of see the sources, the collections, the kind of material that we have that critically engages, like overlaps with their interests and their topics and their, their passions in some way, um, reflects what they are interested in. 
Um, and then invite them to make something, create something new um, based on their encounter with these materials. Um, give them a sense of agency, inspire them to uh, share their interpretation and share some new perspective um, based around this encounter and, and, and understanding of the materials that they've witnessed and kind of are learning about from our materials. Um, and really give a space for play and discovery um, for folks to exercise their creativity, um, do some storytelling and narrative building, and have some stress relief and, and kind of a, a space to take a break and um, a time when it's really important to consider our mental health and that, that of our students. Um, so in fall 2023, um, I led a, a semester, an early uh, semester workshop um, that was really marketed toward new teaching assistants, but also to all teaching faculty, um, sort of a teaching with special collections 101, ways that we work with different classes, kind of a menu of options, ways that we typically can offer support for teaching and designing assignments and um, class instruction. Um, <clears throat> and among the folks who attended, there was a really high level of interest in making um, from uh, the folks who uh, were interested in kind of thinking about ways to collaborate. So that yielded two specific classes that we worked with um, listed here. And while they're both in kind of humanities uh, departments, the majority, if not entirety of the students were STEM majors taking these classes to fulfill requirements. So the first um, was women and gender in science and technology. The second was an English 101 class that's really for computer science majors and engineering majors um, to learn how to do academic writing and research. Um, and the focus of their uh, section was the history of computing. So um, the goals for these sections, as we discussed with faculty, were to introduce the students to these materials um, and get them thinking critically about their, their, their topics by looking at these materials from the past. Um, and then have them create something new based on that encounter. Um, and zines were the, the way that we chose to do that in these two classes. Um, I won't go over everything here, but just to not assume that everyone watching is familiar with zines, um, they are historically um, self-published materials um, that are created through kind of alternative activist um, punk communities or other kind of marginalized communities outside of mainstream commercial publishing, um, often used to share information and explore themes um, of interest and relevance to um, marginalized communities that um, want a, an easier kind of more flexible uh, space to, to disseminate information. Students are very interested when they learn about zines. Most students, undergrads at least, that we've encountered have not, are not familiar with this. Um, and it really is, is kind of an a, a appealing medium for them to express themselves, explore, experiment, and um, feel empowered to uh, create something that's kind of low, low barrier. Um, uh, so we always explain there's no right or wrong way to do it. We can kind of get them started. All you need is one piece of paper. We'll show you how to fold it if you want to make an eight page zine or you can do something different. Um, you can use text, you can use images, you can use both together. Um, and it's a relatively simple and expensive and accessible way to kind of engage with making and, and narrative. So with the women and gender in STEM class, um, the professor shared that she wanted to um, kind of help students explore the interaction between science and social ideas of gender and sex. So um, we organized two sessions, um, two visits that were 75 minutes each. The first one was sort of the traditional um, archives show and tell. So we brought original materials, mostly from the university archives, showing um, the history of women in STEM on campus, um, materials attempting to recruit more women into STEM fields, um, and materials from the Society of Women Engineers. Also, general materials about women students on campus, some of the earliest um, materials that we have reflecting their experiences um, at NC State. 
And we introduced the students to our digitized materials and gave them kind of an optional homework assignment to explore all of the scanned images and documents that we have that seem of interest to them within this topic of women in STEM um, and select any materials that they want to incorporate into their zines that they would make in the next session. So they could print out or we could print for them um, any of these materials, kind of copies of them that they could cut up and remix. So the second session was where we really introduced what are zines and how does it connect to what you're studying here and kind of the idea of feminism and, and feminist activism, zines as a, as a mode of communication in that history as well. Um, and we set the students free to uh, cut up stuff, make collages, narrate, write, um, illustrate. And we also had an optional um, donation station if students wanted to donate any of their zines to the archives um, with no obligation, but we had release forms and um, uh, a little area that they could they could do that if they wished. Um, the second class we worked with, the English 101 class, again, a lot of computer science students who, when looking at some of these materials, could understand them in a way completely different from how I would. They really, um, the programming languages and the kind of technical language of these documents um, were, you know, legible to them in a way that's not to me. So it was very cool to see them come in and in the first part of a two hour session, um, explore materials that we had on, on the tables for them um, from some of the computer simulation collections that we have. Um, and other kind of history of computing on campus um, in the university archives. So um, going back to the late 19th century, some of our um, collections showed kind of early ideas about technology and then computing and um, artificial intelligence and things like that. So the students had a chance to explore the materials and then sit down and do some zine making um, and came up with some really creative uh, zines, some of them very kind of abstract and poetic, some of them very satirical. Um, and the kind of the underlying um, feedback that we had across both of these sessions, which is usually in the making and zine making sessions is, this was so much fun and I'm really excited to um, go into our next class and discuss this more in the context of what we're reading and working on for our, you know, next uh, part of the class. So some of this can be like, this is kind of a break from the usual class discussions. Um, it's, you know, it's fun, but it's also productive. We're, we're really thinking and, and making something new. Um, so some of the takeaways, um, there are some challenges, definitely. Um, it takes time to put this together. It takes time to do a session that involves making, and I'll speak specifically about zine making. Um, once people get into making their zine, they want to spend a while doing it. So sometimes we have to almost sort of like kick people out, but say, hey, you know what? You can come back to the makerspace. They have the materials and the supplies. You can go there right now and just hang out and keep working. Um, we have other spaces in the libraries that can support that. Um, having the supplies and the space um, is, is a constraint. Um, you want to make sure you have enough staff. You know, we typically want to have at least two people there. Um, and especially if you have original materials in the same space, obviously that is a uh, very clear um, uh, rule that you want to separate things. If you have glue sticks and markers or pens or anything like that, having materials in a separate room or having them um, on very far separation from each other um, is something that obviously we have to think about. But the opportunities are are kind of infinite. Um, I think we're we're looking at expanding kind of the range of making that we can bring into the class, partnering with more folks in the libraries who are doing creative stuff. Um, like in the crafting resilience group and makerspace, um, bring in more of our digitized materials. Taylor and a grad student she was working with have made some kind of collage sheets, pulling images from the digital materials that we can put onto paper and bring to zine making and collaging workshops where students can just cut and paste and remix um, some of the images from our collections. Um, the op opportunity for students to donate their creations, um, to create like a new uh, 
collection of, of their work and their perspectives from these encounters is, is a very exciting prospect. Um, and the general kind of way of supporting um, student success through um, giving them the sense of artistic creative agency, telling their stories, creating some narrative or imagining, you know, something new from their encounter with these archival materials um, has all kinds of opportunities for representational belonging, supporting mental health and well-being beyond the classroom. So um, it's it's a very exciting uh, kind of way to think about teaching and outreach, um, especially with STEM collections. And um, so I'm just excited to share that and uh, big props to Taylor for supporting this and leading a lot of this work as well. So um, I will wrap it up there. Wonderful, thank you both so much. Um, we are gonna take questions now. So you can put your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them. Um, we already have one person who said, I have a collection of zines that were made in the last 20 years. What are the ethics on digitizing these? Should they remain in an on-site collection only? That's a good question. I don't know that I'm the most qualified person to answer it. I know there are some other zine librarians out there like Kelly Wooten um, and the Barnard College Zine Library who have been doing this for a while and kind of understand the ethics of zine collecting. Um, I do know that kind of like the ethos of zines is everything is open to share. Um, and there are digital zine libraries that have digitized zines. So that could be a place to look. Um, and I can share, I have another slide uh, slide deck um, that has a list of some of those, um, those kind of repositories. So I would imagine it's probably fine to digitize those. Um, but there are other folks in the profession who are working more, more on kind of building zine collections and how to share those. Any more questions or comments? I had a question for Taylor in regards to your role playing um, lessons. Are Is there any concern about how word gets out to students who might not even be in your class, in your classes now, but students talk to each other. And so they may learn about the characters and stuff before they even take your class. So have you thought about like in a, even like long-term wise, how you might need to switch up your characters at all for your primary sources and stuff? Because I know in a previous institution, I was using archive, archive materials and stuff and we were supposed to be kind of surprising the students with what we were showing them but the last couple times we taught the class actually half the students already knew the answers because they talked to their roommates and stuff who had already taken the class and we found out we actually needed to change it up a little bit because students were coming in already knowing the answers. Um, is that a concern for you and your faculty member at all that maybe you're going to be putting in so much work, but with students talk to their roommates and other classmates, so maybe needing to switch it up in a few years and having to redo all the work again for the future? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. It's certainly not something in its early stages that we have thought about or considered. Um, but I will say, like, I I think that when it comes to this sort of historical role playing game that we've devised, there really is no one right answer. There is no one path a character can take or a decision that it can, a student can make on behalf of their character based on the primary source documentation and um, the instructor's guidance throughout the discussions from the course. Um, so I'd be interested actually to see um, the, the nuanced and varied ways that the students develop their character as the semester progresses. Um, because like I said, there is no right answer. 
um, there is no one path a character can take. It's really dependent upon the student's own understanding of the primary source materials, of the historical events, and of who their character is as a person in any point in time. But that's a really great question to consider. Um, and I am still meeting with the faculty member over the summer to keep in touch. So I will bring that up as a point of discussion. Thank you. And for those who are interested, uh, Virginia did put the link to, to the zine making slides in the chat, um, if you'd like to check those out. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, do you think that these programs are something that would be adaptable for like high school age students as well? Yeah, I definitely think um, zine making or just sort of uh, using crafting and creative making um, as a way of interpreting the past and interpreting primary sources is a really great um, kind of on-ramp to get folks interpreting and, and kind of creating something. Um, I think it's it appeals to students who want to, like, like with Taylor's um, role-playing, like there's there's a little bit more freedom if they can separate their, um, you know, when, when they're looking at a document and are asked to kind of share their thoughts and, and have a discussion um, to give them other ways of interacting with that and engaging. Um, so having like a character in the role play game um, or having, uh, you know, making a piece of art or a zine um, or whatever it may be in reaction to primary sources, I think it, it's a great way for all ages to, to kind of interact with them. I also was going to add, um, I think a lot of these activities are particularly well suited to a high school audience or a high school, high school classroom. Um, we know now, based on a lot of studies in education and psychology, that um, people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have found that um, it's really important to have a very mixed method approach to teaching in that you have some hands-on learning mixed in with reflection, mixed in with discussion, mixed in with um, exposure and analysis of primary source documentation. So I think um, for the high schoolers <laughs> out there, that's actually one of uh, the more beneficial ways to develop course instruction in that they are, um, they are learning um, in a very active and engaged way as opposed to um, sitting in a lecture style classroom setting, which we know now doesn't usually appeal to a diverse population of learners. Yes, um, I, my partner teaches uh, 10th grade US history. And so I hear him tell, <laughs> talk a lot about how it's like, I mean, you're pretty much performing all the time and to get them to pay attention, you know, you have to let them get up and walk around and do things or else they're just going to get up and walk around and do things, you know, not related <laughs> to the lesson. Um, so, yeah, anytime I hear about like creative ways that people can like have, you know, hands on moving around um, kind of things, that's I think, oh, yes, that'll entertain the children <laughs> while also teaching them something. So that, that's good to know. Anyone else have any um, questions or comments? Um, concerning role playing, are there any thoughts about doing this, but um, uh, using a more interactive um, type of role playing that you would see more in, say, something like Dungeons and Dragons? Because, yes. The activity to describe a student is playing a role of whoever this person is, but they're not actually playing off of other people in the class, as I understand what you are doing. Um, the whole thing about, say, a role-playing game like Dungeons and Dragons is that you are interacting with members of your party. You are interacting with non-player characters that are are being done by the um, uh, by the game master. Um, well, Dungeons and Dragons would be the dungeon master. I think of this because when I was in graduate school. 
we actually did role playing in a class in Chinese history. All of us had roles, traditional Chinese roles uh, in a particular culture, in that particular culture. And what was interesting is that one of the players, and I've suspected that this may have been something that the professor did deliberately, did not play the role the way they were supposed to. And so it was very interesting to watch the rest of the class try and adapt to interacting with this person, but in the way that their role would interact with this person. So I'm wondering if there are any thoughts about, about something like that, doing something like that at some point. That's um, really great observations. I agree with you on every aspect um, that you brought up. I think it's mostly a, a time constraint at this point. Um, I do teach other classes um, regularly throughout the semester. And that's uh, Dungeons and Dragons is very complex at, as a game to play um, with a lot of different modules and characters and additions. And so we just don't have the time to build it out to the level of, of a game that's existed for as long as D&D has. Um, that being said, I'm really interested um, in we have a great um, art and design video game development, um, very, very art centric um, campus um, in our College of Design. And so I'm interested in some sort of interdisciplinary um, workshop or um, course instruction in which um, students are creating role playing games um, that can be based on historical topics um, and historical figures. Um, and they themselves are the creators of this output um, and a game that then can be utilized by the campus community. Um, so I think that connects really well with Virginia's presentation on giving the students the agency to also create in a really interesting way while engaging with historical topics. Um, and we also have a ton of resources on campus should a student want to make um, a game board or a gameplay. Um, a tabletop, a game, whatever they decide. Um, so I'd be very interested to pursue that avenue outside of course instruction. All right, we have just a few more minutes. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, we'll go ahead and close things out then. Thank you again to Taylor and Virginia, and thank you to all of our presenters today um, and for all to all of our guests. Um, tomorrow, um, we'll be back here at 9.15 Eastern, 8.15 Central. Um, and make sure um, when you attend tomorrow that you click on that second Zoom link that was sent out um, with the registration email. Um, any other announcements, Jennifer? that pretty much it. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys again. And um, we'll see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye.